Matthew chapter 5, verses 38 to 48. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you, and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? You therefore must be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Well, you know, maybe we should just sit in those words for a moment. Love your enemies. Pray for them. Do good to those who hurt you. Don't seek revenge. No eye for an eye, no tooth for a tooth. Those are really hard words because, to be honest, I love a good revenge movie. Count of Monte Cristo, the John Wick series, a good movie where the main character kind of helps other people get what's due to them. I was thinking about that as I was flying and traveling a little bit last month. A, a story I heard about an airport employee. There was one of those guys, you know, kind of out curbside uh, collecting baggage. And there was a, a customer who was being, you know, really micromanaging him, not kind to him, kind of on his case, telling him how he could do his job and how you know, he shouldn't be employed there anymore, how he was feeling at the job, all, the, all those things, you know, publicly humiliating the guy. But the employee was handling it with such calm. In fact, after the disgruntled flyer kind of left, someone went up to the employee and said, hey, I, I just got to hand it to you. I don't know how you managed to keep your calm. I mean, that guy was just so abusive and shouldn't have said those kinds of things. Like, how did you do that? And he said, well, it's actually relatively easy. He said, you see that guy? He's flying to Vancouver, but his luggage is going to Costa Rica. <laughs> and we love a good revenge story. Like, we love it when we see someone getting what we think is due them. But Jesus is going to teach us another way. Instead of, instead of seeking revenge, seek to honor God. Instead of settling accounts, seek the king of heaven. So I invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 5. We're continuing for really the rest, most of the rest of the year through this Sermon on the Mount, just going bit by bit. And we've seen that Jesus invites us to kingdom living. This was his message that the kingdom of God is advancing and coming, and he invited everyone to join. We saw that the kingdom of God has a different operating system. And, you know, just as Android is different than Apple, the kingdom of God has a very different operating system than the rest of the world. And this is what Jesus is trying to teach us here in talking about the real heart of the kingdom. And five times here in chapter five, he uses this phrase, you've heard it set, but I tell you. And he's really saying there's these Old Testament verses or passages that, that you've heard, but they've been twisted a little bit. The teachers have manipulated them. I want to tell you what they really mean. What's the heart of God when he gave you these verses? And friends, this is what the Messiah was expected to do. When the people of Israel were looking for the Christ, the Messiah, they were looking for someone who had explained the Torah and the Old Testament. 
that this was one sign of who the Savior was going to be, that he would say, I want you to know what the real heart of God is. And he said, you've heard it said, you know, don't kill someone. I want to tell you about anger in your heart, because that's a whole different level. You've heard it said, you know, don't commit adultery. I want to tell you what lust will really do in your life. I tell you, you've heard it said, don't make an oath or don't lie. I just want you to be honest. Let your yes be a yes and your no be a no. That's the heart of the kingdom, that there's this trust. And today he's going to talk horizontally. He's going to talk about our relationships with other people, particularly those people we don't want in our life. Those people we're hoping something bad will happen. Those people who have thwarted us. He's going to talk about, you know, the roommate who maybe stiffed us our rent. He's going to talk about the prof that really doesn't give us the grade that we deserve. He's going to talk about the child who, who just speaks badly about their parent. He's going to talk about the spouse who's just walked away and left you in rejection. He's going to talk about the coworker who has maligned you at work. He's going to talk about the person you thought you were a friend with until they destroyed you on social media. What do you do with your hurts? And maybe as we begin, you might even just think, who is there that maybe is an enemy? Who is there I, I want revenge for? Who's the person in the middle of the night that, that you wake up thinking and ruminating about? Who is that person who has hurt you? Because Jesus is going to teach us some things. And that's when he said, when you think about settling accounts, I want you to think about seeking the highest good. In verse 38, he says, you've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, don't resist the one who is evil, for if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other one also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, well, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you, and don't refuse the one who would borrow from you. And Jesus here uses that phrase, you've heard it said, and he talks about this very ancient law, the Lex Talionis, it goes back to the law code of Hammurabi, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. You've heard it understood about this justice system. If someone takes something, you take an equal value from them. And it goes back to the book of Exodus. The Jewish teachers would go to Exodus 21, verse 22, and said, when men strive together and, and they hit a pregnant woman so that her children come out. But if there's no harm, the one who hit her shall surely be fined as a woman's husband shall impose on him, and he shall also pay as the judge determines. But if there is harm, then you shall pay life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, and wound for wound. And here in Exodus, as Israel is about to enter into the promised land, God is really saying to them, when you are hurt, I want you to avoid revenge. Don't have a vengeful character. He said, now, if a crime is committed, if someone hurts a pregnant woman and they, the baby's okay, then maybe there's a little fine. But if someone hurts the baby and, and there is a, a hurt, a deformity, something happens, then there should be a little recompense. Now, when God gave this law, what he was giving to Israel was kind of a law code. This is what judges were to use to make sure that they did not uh, overly punish someone for a crime that they committed. This was really to limit justice. And it was certainly not an intention to seek out revenge if you're hurt. Oh, you took this, now I'm going to take that, or you did this to me, and I'm going to do that. But that's what had happened through the teaching from the time of Exodus to Jesus. And when Jesus is teaching on the Sermon on the Mount, he's got a, a whole mountain full of people who love to seek revenge on others. They were just waiting for someone to hurt them so they could hurt them back. 
And there was this continued retaliation and hurt. You said something, I'm going to say it to you. You did something, I'm going to give it back to you even more. And there's these cycles of revenge that were happening in Jesus' day. And it wasn't that this Old Testament law was, was used to kind of limit, like, hey, you can't hurt a person too much when they hurt you. It was used as an excuse to seek revenge. And Jesus said, the law of the kingdom's different. He says, don't do that. In fact, there he says, you've heard it said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, don't resist the one who is evil. And, and the word to resist really is to get revenge. Don't get revenge on the one. You've heard it said, oh, it's okay. I tell you, don't do that. That the law of the kingdom is different. The way of the kingdom is different. The way of Jesus is very different. And they're like, well, we don't understand that. What's that really mean? And Jesus goes on to give three kind of everyday examples of where this might be. And the first, he said, if someone insults you, slaps you on the right cheek, you, you seek to honor God. Don't seek to get revenge. You seek to honor God. And he said, you turn the other cheek. And so he's talking about a situation where someone would give an insult. And in that day, one of the ways that you would insult someone is slapping them publicly or hitting them or, or kind of saying, hey, we really disagree. This is bad. Now, Jesus here is very specific. He says, if someone slaps you on what? The right cheek. Now, you would only slap someone with your right hand because you would never touch someone with your left hand because your left hand is, is what you would use after you went to the bathroom and did your business. It was kind of considered unclean. You'd never touch anybody with that. You'd only use your right hand. Now, if someone is facing you, the natural response would be to slap them where? On their left cheek. But Jesus said, if they hit strike you on your right cheek, in order to do that, you have to give them a backhanded slap. And to slap someone on the cheek was an offense enough. To give them a backhanded slap was kind of doubly offensive. And so Jesus here is saying, hey, if someone really offends you, he says something crazy, turn the other cheek. So you can imagine that a family is uh, in Jerusalem, maybe they're doing their shopping, <coughs> maybe they're taking the sacrifice to the temple, and they meet some old friends. And they're, they're having a conversation, and they're talking about different things, and then all of a sudden, the, the conversation it moves to politics. And you begin to think that you kind of agree politically, but then all of a sudden it becomes obvious that you have lots of disagreements and you can't begin to think that the other person thinks what they want. And then that person begins to say something nasty about the political system that you really value and you agree. In. And, and all of a sudden, as you're arguing and debating, that one guy just slaps you on the cheek. Everybody saw it. Your honor's at stake. And the natural response is, you hit me, I'm going to take you out. Right? How dare you do that? In front of my family and my kids, you have no right to do that. And Jesus says, instead of saying, hey, I'm going to take you out. You can't do that. You, let's go to the back alley and fight this out. Jesus says, hey, take a minute. Don't look at the offense. Look at the person. And maybe instead of getting ready to give them one back, you say, hey, buddy, I think you must have had a bad day. What else is going on? What else is going on in your life that would get you so heated? And instead of getting ready to punch the, you just turn the cheek. Now, I don't think Jesus is really thinking someone's going to slap you back. What he's saying is that when you stop the cycle of violence and you choose when you choose, this is not passive, this is not laying down and being a doormat. When you choose instead to do what you think is natural and retaliate, but you choose to stop the cycle of violence and speak to the person, it changes them. 
it changes them. It speaks to them. You're never going to settle a political dispute by boxing it out. It changes them. And you may say, but hey, my honor's at stake. Like, what about my honor? Everybody saw. It was a public display. He saw how that guy humiliated me. Jesus here is reminding us our honor doesn't come from what someone else says. Our honor comes from God. Our honor comes from the blessed life. That's how he starts the Sermon on the Mount. He says, you're blessed. Those who are poor in spirit, those who are merciful, those who mourn, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, those who are peacemakers, you are blessed. That's where your honor comes from. You have the greatest blessing of God in you. What's that matter? If someone in their ignorance is challenging your honor. It's what God thinks of you. And we see that this is how Jesus lived. Now, Jesus talking about being insulted. He's not talking about injustices necessarily. He's talking about being insulted. And Jesus was insulted a number of times. They called him numerous things. They said he was like Satan himself is the Beelzebub, the Lord of the flies. They spit on him, mocked him on the cross. Now, can you imagine if when they had started mocking Jesus or calling him the son of Satan, and Jesus like, you can't call me that. This is who you are. And he starts punching about or getting into a fist fight. Can you imagine Jesus doing that? Jesus says, my honor doesn't come from what people say. Now, when Jesus saw other people in injustices, when Jesus saw people hurting, when Jesus saw that things weren't fair to the other person, he was right in there helping. But when he was dealing with injustice or with insult, he tried to honor God. And Jesus here, hey, stop, take a beat. Instead of focusing on your feelings for a moment, focus on the other person. What does God want to do in them? And then he may have thought that the people were thinking, oh, well, that's kind of, yeah, maybe how often do you get publicly insulted? Maybe that's not a really big thing. And Jesus kind of ramps it up a bit. And he, he talks about when you're really in conflict with someone, he, he says, I want you to live in peace with others. And he says, if someone sues you for your tunic, if someone is in conflict and, and you owe them or they want to take your tunic, he said, why don't you just give them your coat as well, your cloak? And your tunic was like a basic shirt, maybe more like an undershirt. It wasn't a, a hugely valuable piece of clothing. This is not like a huge law case. This is not someone who's really taking you to the cleaners. This is this someone who's maybe trying to get back at you. And, and it would be easy to say, oh, well, you, you, you think I owe you my tunic? Like, you owe me this, or you did that to me. Isn't that often what happens? We start this cycle. Oh, if I owe you this, then what about when you did this? Now you owe me. Well, I owe you more, and it goes back and forth. Jesus said, just stop the cycle. If someone wants your shirt, then why don't you give them your coat? Now, what's amazing about what Jesus says here is that the cloak, the, the outer garment, was kind of an inalienable right that people had. You could not take that because that was your warmth, that was your blanket at night, that's what kept the elements off. No one could ever sue you for your coat. Jesus here is saying, hey, you could act like base human beings, because it doesn't take a lot of maturity to be able to seek revenge. This is what two-year-olds do, right? If you go to the nursery right now, and a two-year-old takes another two-year-old's toy, what's going to happen? They're going to reach out and grab it, take it back. Or I'm going to take another toy. Or I'm going to do that. Because Jesus here say, this is, this is life in the kingdom of darkness. This is how the world operates. I encourage you, dig down deep and do something so outrageous, so countercultural that it changes people. 
you know, court cases have gone on, divorce cases that have gone on, because people are fighting and fighting and being silly and ridiculous with each other because they want their pound of flesh from the other. And the divorce lawyer is the only one who wins. Years ago, I, I saw this article online. It, it, it made me laugh. It was a news story about a couple in Vietnam who were getting divorced, and it was a very, very bitter divorce. And the husband didn't want the wife to get anything and vice versa. So in the end, they decided to split everything, and they split everything, even their house. And he went with saw and cut their house in half. I can show you the picture. She got half a house. One side with the wall, the other side open. He got a dismantled house. And Jesus said, when, do that, when, when people are at odds with you, break the conflict. Do what you can. This is what life in the kingdom is about. This is why it's so countercultural. And for, if, if you know it, and everybody, you know, people go, oh, the religions are all the same. Every religion is the same. No, every religion is not the same. No other religion says that. No other religious teacher said that. This is why the words of Jesus are so remarkable. Turn the other cheek. Give them your coat. I mean, this is what's so amazing. Jesus is saying there's a completely different way to live. And some of you grew up in families. Some of you grew up in country where everything was about retribution and how much you can take from the other person. That person hurt you, so I'm going to hurt them back. And it becomes so oppressive. And Jesus here is saying you can be, you can be so owned by vengeance, right? You can be so controlled by hurt feelings that it's going to destroy you. It's much better to give your stuff away and be free from that. And some of you, I'm sure this morning, a room this side, you're owned by hurt feelings. Your anger, your disappointment, your frustration, your issues with another person that consumes a lot of your thinking and your time, and you're owned by that. And Jesus says, is that really the value of the kingdom? Just forget about it. It's better to just give them something than to be owned by it. And then he talks about when someone imposes upon you. He says, someone asks you to go for a mile. Why don't you go too? Go the extra mile for them. Now, what Jesus is referring to here is a Roman law. The Romans were uh, in charge of Israel. They had kept Israel's kind of political prisoners. The Roman Empire controlled everything, and the Roman soldiers were everything. And if a Roman soldier asks you to do something, then you had to do it. If a Roman soldier walked up with his really nice Ferragamo sandals and said, hey, would you clean these for me? You had to clean them. This is what got Simon of Cyrene, if you remember in the story of the crucifixion of Jesus, Jesus couldn't carry the cross anymore, and the Roman soldier did what? Pointed to Simon and said, you carry it, because that was the law. Any male, female, child, adult had to do what a Roman soldier said. And if a Roman soldier came to you while you're having Sabbath dinner and you're enjoying a rest with your family and kind of pushes his Louis Vuitton huge backpack into you and says, hey, I'm tired of carrying it, you carry it, you had to carry it for a mile. In fact, some people had stakes like a mile down the road from their house so that if a soldier asks them to do something, they're like, well, the mile's over. And Jesus said, you can carry it for a mile. I tell you how different it would be if someone imposes on you. Why don't you go to them and say, hey, I bet you've had a tough day too. Let me carry it some, a little more. I know I could just say I could be done, but I see you. And let's go a little further. Let's talk a little more. 
And Jesus here says, you can look at the offense. You can feel angry about the offense. You can feel how put upon you've been. How could they ask me to do that? Why are they doing that? I didn't want to help them. I didn't really want to help them in the first place. Or you could say, hey, God, help me to see them as you see them. Because this is what we often do. All of a sudden, we no longer look at people. We only see the offense. We see the hurt. We see the frustration. We see what they've done to us. And Jesus here says, hey, the law of the kingdom is very different. See the person. And begin to see the person as Jesus sees them. And the basic operating system of the kingdom of God is agape love. It's a serving love. It's seeing the people as they are and really serving them. And I'm sure that there were some people on the mountain that day who were listening to Jesus and like, hey, wait a minute, Jesus. Like, we don't have to do that. That's like too much. Like, what about some of our enemies? Like, we should be able just to keep our distance and, and get back at people and, and do what we want. And Jesus says, yeah, let me talk about that. And he goes on and he talks about particularly those who are our enemies, and he says, when you have an enemy, I want you to love them as God loves them. And he says, you've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. And I'm sure they were saying, yeah, remember that hate our enemy part. Like, how does what you said before affect this? But I say to you, Jesus says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes the sun rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do that? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Not, do not the Gentiles do the same? You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. And Jesus said, yeah, you've heard it said, right, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Now, the reality is the Old Testament never said it. It says one of the times Jesus said, oh, you've heard it said. And he's not quoting what Scripture said. He's quoting how it had been taught. Scripture never added hate your enemy. It always just said love your neighbor. In fact, we see that in Leviticus chapter 19, or chapter 18, verse 19. It's in, as Israel was entering into the promised land, and it's God saying, here's how you should live. He says, you shall not take vengeance, this is what he's already talking about, or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself, for I am the Lord. And the scripture always talks about love your neighbor. Now, that became a question of who's my neighbor. And remember, some people went to Jesus one day and said, hey, who's my neighbor? And Jesus tells the story of the good Samaritan. He says, your neighbor is even someone like the Samaritan who's not like you, who's very different, and you love them. Because what had happened is they were looking at these passages and the religious teachers began to extrapolate. Teachers said, oh, we should love our neighbor, those who are close to us, living like us and, and, and near to us. But that means we can hate anybody else. And so they began to hate the outsider. Began to hate people who weren't in the same economic system. They began to hate a whole bunch of other people. And, and Jesus here says, well, you've heard it said, because the teachers have said, love your neighbor, but hate your enemy. And so on the mountain that day, there were a lot of people who loved the people that they liked, but had a whole list of people that they hated. In fact, some of the Old Testament, or some of the commentaries on the Old Testament, like the Mishnah, some of the Qumran scrolls, they would talk about, oh, you can love the children of the light, love those who love God, but you can hate children of the darkness. You can hate them. And I don't think that's much different than us today. Right? We have a mental list. We may not write it down, but we have a mental list of, of people we love. Oh, those are easy to love. Yep, I'm going to love those. And we have a mental list of people Oh, those are really difficult to love, or those I can't love. 
And we might even say, well, those are people that don't deserve God's love. Now, it's not saying we have to agree with people. It's not saying that we value what they value. It's not saying that we approve of what they do. Jesus here doesn't say approve. He doesn't say value. He says love. That at the base operating system of the kingdom of God, there is this agape love. And this is, again, what separates Christianity from other places. Because let's be honest, we can't do that ourselves. Like, we can't love ourselves. We can't love people who we find hard to love or maybe we disagree with. To, To love them seems so hard. We can't do it. I'm sure you're here today and you're like, oh, I may want to love someone, but I can't love them. I don't have it within me to love them. You don't have it within you. But Christ in us, this is why Jesus came, to empower us with his spirit to do that. And the word love here is is not an ooey-gooey feeling of love, because that's sometimes what we think. It's like, well, I, I can't even feel like I could love them. There's lots of times we are called to love people and we may not feel like it. It's a serving kind of love. It's a sacrificial love. It's a giving kind of love. It's a love that Jesus, the night before he went to the cross, he's having dinner with his disciples. No one washed their feet. They're at a table laying head to foot with smelly feet. And Jesus gets up and washes the feet of someone who's going to betray him and someone who's going to deny him. I don't know if Jesus felt like it, but he loved them. And Jesus here says, there's a love, there's something happens, there's a reward when we love people that we don't naturally love. He says, if you love people that you like to love, you love people that are easy to love, he says, what reward is there? He says, the the tax collectors do that. Right? People who don't have a relationship with God, they love their own kind. They love people. There's no reward in that. There's no reward for doing something that's easy. And I don't know, but growing up, if I ate cake, my parents never said, oh, good boy, thank you for eating and trying cake. Here's some ice cream to go with it. You get a reward for eating cake. My parents would reward me if I ate cream peas or something that I could barely get in my mouth. Right? There's no reward for doing something easy. And Jesus here says there's two things. So think it, someone who's your enemy, someone who's really thwarted you. Two things to do. He says, first of all, pray for them. In every conflict, pray for those who hurt you. Because every conflict is an opportunity to show us what's really inside us. When we're squeezed and repressed in every conflict, it's what comes out. Does anger, hate, frustration, retribution come out, or does Christ come out? And every conflict is an opportunity for us to point people to that which is valuable to us. And many times we point people to retribution, balancing the scales of justice. That's what's really valuable to us, is to say, hey, the love of God, that's what's valuable. That's valuable. And he said, pray for your enemies. Now, I don't think that's like an anger. It's like, oh, God, get rid of this enemy, or oh, God, you know, May this enemy, you know, have a heart attack in the middle of the night and not wake up. That's not the kind of prayer. Why would we pray for our enemies? Because who is it that God often uses in our life? The people God's used in my life, most of all, have been those who are against me. As we saw with the story in the life of Joseph, Joseph says at the end to his brothers who were his enemies at one time, You meant it for evil, but God used it for good. That often the people God use in our life are our enemies. To show what's in us, to change us, 
to transform us. The people that may be on your list, the people who keep you up at night, those are the people God is using to draw you near to him. Because often what enemies do, the reason we think a person is our enemy is they're trying to stop us from what? Building our kingdom. They're stopping us from having the happy, successful life we want. It's like we're on this track to get something. An enemy criticizes us, accuses us, stops us, makes it difficult. And when that happens, we're to stop and say, oh, maybe God's using that person to keep me from making a mistake. Or maybe I've been so busy building my kingdom, I need to build his kingdom. Secondly, Jesus says, love them. Love your enemies. The word is really serve them. To serve our enemies as we need to. And to see people as souls. See, this is often, again, what happens. When someone is our enemy, we see them as a frustration. We see them as a hindrance. We see them for what they say or what they do. Jesus here says, see them as God sees them. They're souls. They're people who need to know God. We don't see them for their mistakes or their issues. We see them as God sees them. And this is what Jesus said, because God treats them equally. God doesn't say, hey, well, I'm going to love these people, and the sun and the rain is going to come on them, but I'm going to hate these people, and they're going to get no rain, and everything's going to dry up. It happens to everybody. God shows no partiality. And when you love them, you're just like God. Because God loves them. And Jesus says, that's how people will know you're sons and daughters of God. Have you ever seen a child and it's like, man, that's a spitting image of their mom or that's a spitting image of their dad. Like, I can't believe the likeness. Jesus is saying, when you love, when you turn the other cheek, when you go the extra mile, when you pray for the enemies, when you speak well of them, when you do those things, when you serve them, people are going to go, I don't know about them, but that's God. That's what God would do. One of the first missionary biographies I read as a teenager was the biography of Jim Elliott. And he, along with five other men and their families, went to Ecuador to work with the Aka tribe. And they were a tribe of people who didn't know English, didn't know anything about faith or Jesus, had their, uh, their own religion, and these families moved in to try to teach them about Jesus, share the hope of the gospel with them. One day, as these five men were working, there was a misunderstanding between them and the Akas, and the Akas killed all of them, all in one, one moment. And their grieving families came back to the U.S., had their funerals. Would have been easy to say, oh, they're our enemy. Look what they did. Look what they stole away. But Jim's widow, Elizabeth, and Nate Saint's sister, and some others and their families moved back to Ecuador to share with the people who had stolen their family members' lives. And it wasn't long before they came to know Christ. A church was there. In fact, one of the men who had killed one of the missionaries became like a second dad to some of the people there. Because someone said, I'm going to go the extra mile. I'm going to turn the cheek. I'm going to live with generosity. I'm going to start loving my enemies. I'm going to pray for them. And I'm going to serve them. So who was on your list? When, when you heard the word enemy, when you heard get back at someone, what were the names that were there? How can you 
be generous to them instead of seek retribution? How can you pray for them? And maybe is there a way to serve them? Let's pray together. Father, this is so challenging and difficult because we, uh, we want to live by the laws of our own kingdom. We want to live by the laws of things that make us feel good or make us feel better, even just for a moment, but which ultimately don't satisfy. Lord, help us to see people as you see them. Help us see our enemies, not as people who thwart us, but who help us find your way. Help us to see people not by our own frustration, but to see them as living souls that you love. Father, I pray that we would be agents of peace, that we would bring peace to relationships, we bring peace to a world. Lord, we have an angry, fractured, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth world. We have a very divided world where people don't want to listen and don't want to talk. And Lord, would we be different? Would we bring a new kingdom ethic to place? We're going to sing a very familiar hymn, When Peace Like a River, It's Well With Our Soul. Often when we sing it, we think of maybe some of the hurts or difficulties or pain that we're going through. Maybe as we sing it today, we can just lay down our relational hurts, our desire to get back, our need for revenge, lay down the hate in our heart, because that's what Jesus went to the cross for, and can we pick up his peace? Let's stand and worship together. Hey everyone, my name is Sawyer. I'm so glad that you joined us today. If you were impacted by this message and you have a desire to dive deeper into a church community, I would encourage you to join us in person for our full Sunday experience. We'd love to meet you at our Welcome Center and get to know who you are. And here at Bayview, our desire is for everyone, everywhere, to experience God's love. So whether you are a lifelong believer or you're kind of going through a season of doubts and questioning or you're simply curious about church, you are welcome and you are loved here. Also be sure to check out our website, bayviewglen.org, for our service times and any midweek events to join. So come be part of our community here at Bayview Glen Church. Can't wait to see you.